our last session, our final workshop in this room. Um, and this is the session number seven, Home Strategies for Reducing Carbon Footprints. So in this workshop, we're going to um, learn about a pretty diverse variety of ways that you can make your home more energy efficient, use renewables, and reduce your fossil fuel consumption. Aidan Maynard will discuss the advantages of heat pumps. David Goodwin will d demonstrate how to make a window insert. And Rory Donahoe will cover mass safe programs for residential energy improvements. So we're going to start with um, Aidan Maynard, who is the owner of His and Hers Energy Efficiency, which provides um, building electrification support in Western Massachusetts and beyond. He's an energy consultant with 20 years of experience and has contributed to many major retrofits and zero energy ready new homes. And he shares an office with his wife in Williamsburg with his three kids and two dogs. Aid His and hers energy efficiency. Yep. Yeah, we're uh, we're hers rating company, so we do a lot of um, new home code compliance, stretch code compliance, energy modeling, and then increasingly existing home projects. You know, helping people electrify, design retrofits. That's more of my background. So I'm going to talk today about um, about heat pumps and home electrification this is a huge topic, so I'm going to move pretty quick. There's about 15 slides. Um, we're going to talk about heat pumps or new construction and old construction. Can you guys hear me in the back? Roy, it's loud enough back there? It's okay? Good. Um, cool. So um, my name's Aiden, um, and a funny thing is I got into this through natural building, so that's a cob cottage there. And, that's how I stoked my interest in building sustainable homes and then quickly realized we have a whole lot of old homes that we need to fix. And instead of building new cob homes, we should be fixing our old homes. And that's still the huge lift that uh, we have. I um, live in Williamsburg, and uh, I just mentioned what we do. Um, basically a building energy consultant, mostly for residential. Uh, we help people design HVAC systems. Um, do building diagnostics and en envelope design uh, here in Western Mass, out in the Berkshires, and increasingly in Connecticut as well. We do a lot of code. We help builders with code minimum houses to passive houses, the whole, the whole gamut. So today I'll talk about heat pumps, why they're so popular. Um, we'll talk about the technology a little bit with the uh, fine print that I'm not an engineer. So maybe there's some engineers in the room, but I'm not that. I don't pretend to be. Um, I don't cost as much. And uh, there's a lot of information online if you really want to uh, dive into this technology to learn about it. Um, we'll talk about common types in, uh, in homes, different configurations in a new construction and old construction. And then we'll talk about a very related topic of the uh, proper retrofit loading order, kind of how to deal with old houses. And then, of course, the thing on everyone's mind, incentives and rebates. I'll touch upon that. I'm sure that's been well talked about today. I know Rory's going to talk about that, too after me, so I'll just talk uh, briefly on that. Um, all right, so heat pumps. So why, why are we kind of having a moment with heat pumps? Well, the, the big thing, and this is, you know, you're all well aware of this, the 2021 Mass Climate Bill requires us to reduce our carbon emissions um, really to zero by 2050. Um, so to even have a chance, we have to fix our building stock, right? It's like the elephant in the room, um, as far as I'm concerned. Um, so. Electrification is really our only path forward. We need to cut the fossil fuel in our buildings and, and burn more electricity, or consume more electricity, I should say. Um, so kind of the, the interesting thing about the bill is that what we're seeing with rebates right now with mass save is because they've, they've expanded mass saves calling to go beyond just cost effective energy efficiency which for years, you know, forever, right, for 30 years that's been what it's about. It's, and, and, um, I've been involved with some of the policy stuff about 10 years ago and really frustrated by that limited definition of cost effective, right? And so now what's changed is the state can require Mass Save to look to, look to meet our state uh, um, greenhouse uh, emission reduction goals. So that's why we're seeing a lot of money um, be, that goes beyond just what's cost effective. So basically they can spend ratepayer money 
in ways that are not just deemed cost effective according to these arcane metrics. Um, so heat pumps are also having a moment because the technology's come a long way. Uh, we still hear a lot of people arguing against that uh, without kind of real facts. Um, I'm not gonna get into that, but it really is. I was just up in Vermont yesterday at four houses, all heat pumps up in a colder climate zone than us. And then there's kind of a tipping point right now. You know, we're all taking our energy use and consumption more seriously. It's really up to us, right? We're not waiting for the, the feds to do something. It's, it's like, you know, if you have a leaky old house, that's on you. You know, you're responsible for your emissions and, and, and how you make your investments, how you spend your resources. So that's also why electrification and heat pumps is, is popular. So how does the technology work? Um, I'm not gonna, again, I'm not an engineer. Um, basically, it's, it's pretty amazing. It moves heat from one place to another. It doesn't actually make heat. It, it condenses and compresses um, liquids and through, with evaporation. And it basically relies on thermodynamics to move heat um, in and out of the home. Basically a refrigerator, similar technology. Magic, it's, it's magic. Um, again, I could, I probably should have a more technical explanation and I will dive into YouTube and look, there's plenty of stuff out there. Um, but really, uh, in terms of applications and practicality, this is the things we need to know, is that as it gets colder outside, heat pumps lose capacity. So for cold climates like us, sizing them is difficult. Um, it's very important that heat pumps that we select here are on the NEEP uh, cold climate air source heat pump list. That's a database um, that I, I hope is regularly updated because a lot of new technology out there. Um, and the Mass Save program does require that uh, heat pumps that get rebates uh, are on that list. So cold hardy just means that they don't, the performance isn't compromised significantly as it gets colder out. I mean, it, it is because they lose capacity the colder it is outside. Um, and that can be a challenge for sizing. Um, also in very low load homes, you can easily oversize heat pumps. I've seen floors buckle because there's just too much heat pump capacity in, in the summertime. The, it, the, thing, the house doesn't get, um, the humidity doesn't drop. So sizing is, is kind of a mix between uh, an art and a technical process. Um, oftentimes you hear contractors say, well, we have to size for comfort. And that's somewhat true with heat pumps, partly because they, the distribution cannot be as extensive. So, you know, like a ductless mini split head, you have point source heat. You don't have this large distribution. So you do have to consider that when designing the systems. Um, there's a lot of different configurations, so I'll get into that in a minute. And they have different uh, performance characteristics. So um, in the top left, these are different configurations for heat pumps in homes. Uh, Multi-split you know, uh, and mini-splits. So multi-split basically is one condenser with multiple heads, um, or it could be a ducted system and heads, it could be ceiling mount heads, floor mount, wall mount, uh, sharing a condenser, um, or there's the the standard mini split, the one-to-one, -one, where you have one condenser outside, one head. That's gonna have the best performance and also cost more. Um, ducted heat pumps are popular. Um, that's where, you know, it's similar to a, a standard HVAC system with ductwork. Um, you do have to be careful reusing old ductwork any, on any system. Um, I've, I've been involved with some aggressive geothermal sales lately where they're saying, well, if you have ductwork, we'll give you really good pricing and come in and just put a new system. But more often than not, duct, existing ductwork needs to be revamped um, for this technology, um, partly because old ductwork is often not installed well to current standards, and also because when you have different um, systems pushing the air through the ducts, you need different design. There's a different criteria for the design. So be wary of no problem, we'll just throw it into your old ductwork. Um, a hybrid heat pump system, um, dual fuel. So you see this, um, this is popular with people who are concerned about being all electric. Basically you have a furnace with a standard forced air system and then on top of it, instead of an AC coil, is a heat pump. So you can use that heat pump um, through, you know, into the winter as your heat and then in the summer for all your cooling, of course. And then at a certain set point, when it gets certain temperature outside, the system will automatically turn over to the fossil furnace, right, when that heat pump loses its capacity and efficiencies. Uh, geothermal is also a heat pump. That's ground source, um, and there's various configurations for that. 
Um, something that's increasingly popular but not yet w widespread on the market is air to water heat pumps. And this is, I'm very intrigued with this because we have a lot of houses that have existing hot water distribution, right? We have baseboards, old radiators, um, radiant slabs, et cetera. So how can we maintain that distribution, which is very comfortable, and use heat pumps? So this is basically taking air, air source heat pump and then it converts it, uh, heat exchanges to liquid that gets pumped through your house. Um, there's not a whole lot of options right now in the market and even less installers that can install those well. So, but it's, it's coming, I imagine. All right, so heat pumps and new construction. Um, in my opinion, 100% of the time, if you're building a new home, you know, if you're spending those resources, um, you know, lifetime goal, dream house, whatever it might be, or small ADU, um, absolutely it should be a heat pump. And this is an easy crowd to say that to. There's some crowds where it would get heckled, I'll get heckled right now, um, because of, basically because of poor home design. So to do this, it needs to start in design. It's not an afterthought. Five minutes left, all right. Um, so it requires good insulation and air tightness. Um, and the more complex the geometry, like that house on the, on the left, um, the harder it is to have a good building envelope. Not impossible, just more expensive, more difficult. The easier the geometry, the easier it is to have a good envelope, you know, airtight, air barrier, et cetera. Um, room layout is important to consider. But absolutely, every, every new home should have them. Old construction is complicated, right? It, it, you gotta be leery of just throwing in heat pumps in old houses. I'll give one, one example. Rory can talk about this too. Is uh, you have an old house with old oil boiler in the basement. Right, that, that thing is ancient, but it is, and the basement's the warmest room in the house because there's so much heat coming off of that boiler. You wanna get rid of it, great. You can't just throw heat pumps in your house thinking that you're just gonna swap out that system because your basement's gonna get even colder, even wetter, leading to other issues. All these infrared pictures here are from houses where people wanted to convert to heat pumps. And they had major thermal boundary flaws. There's major issues in the house that need to be addressed first. So you really have to do uh, envelope upgrades um, and not, not full energy retrofit. You know, what is practical? And that means different things for different people. Um, how much it costs, long-term goals for the house, um, your, your resources, of course. Um, but envelope upgrades have to be considered. And that takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work. Um, there's a retrofit loading order, right? So kind of the proper way to think about old homes is, well, what are the building durability, health and safety issues? We get into a thermal envelope to conserve, basically to reduce the loads, and then mechanical equipment upgrades, and then renewables after that. That's kind of the loading order to any practical retrofit to zero energy, major deep energy retrofit. All right, so a couple more slides here. Uh, Roy's gonna talk about this. I'm sure there's a huge prescriptive heat pump rebate right now in Mass Save. Just got announced $10,000 for air source heat pump. Um, and you have to get a Mass Save audit. You have to follow through with the weatherization upgrades. Um, there's less but still wonderful supplemental. So if you're not cutting the cord to your fossil system, you can get good rebates. Um, now, that's great. My concerns with it is that there's no sizing requirement. So there's no requirement that a contractor sizing things properly. Um, and there is an envelope upgrade requirement. Uh, I just learned from Rory, so you do have to follow the mass save spec. With that said, that often may not be far enough uh, for the house. So is the market ready? Are the contractors ready for these kind of incentives? Not yet. Um, is mass save ready? I don't think their system ha is ready for this type of, um, to support people in this conversion yet. Although there are ex exceptions. One is the mass save renovations and additions program, which we work in and it's more, uh, Comprehensive, it involves an energy consultant doing energy modeling. I'm not gonna talk about stretch code. Um, any questions? Yeah, good. Yeah, Absolutely, yeah, thank you. So, um, yeah, yeah, so she asked, I gave that example in an old house, if you just swap out an old oil boiler with heat pumps, uh, it could actually lead to more problems in the house. So you have an old boiler, say it's 20 years old in the basement, it's probably oversized, it's kicking off lots of heat, right? Your basement might be the warmest room in the house, literally, not, you know. And, but that basement also may not, probably is not well insulated, maybe it has old field stone, 
has maybe water, maybe a perimeter drain, just moisture, right? Coming up from a slab without vapor controls through foundation walls, air leakage in the summer. So right now, with that oil boiler, all that heat is dry drying that space out. But as soon as you cut that off and you put in, say, like six ductless mini splits head upstairs and you go all electric, your basement's not getting any heat anymore, right? You're taking the mechanicals out of that cold space, which can lead to major issues, right? Because temperature's gonna drop further, moisture content's gonna increase, you're gonna get mold, you know, dew point, et cetera, et cetera. So you really need to go into these decisions thinking, what is the right order here? Maybe I should take, before I do this heat pump, maybe I should take $10,000 and really fix my basement, right? And then maybe I'm putting in two heads and then, you know, and then maybe in a couple of years I'll do the rest. Or, you know, there's, there's proper loading order to really protect your home and to also, you know, be comfortable because your floor is going to get cold in that situation, right? Any other questions? Nope, there's uh, many different configurations. So um, you can have ducted heat pumps, and what the newer technology, there is some available, is air to water. So it's air source heat pump that converts to water distribution. So you can have radiators. Yep, uh, radiant floor. I think you'd probably get in some issues. I mean, old radiators, you have to be, you have to have them all pressure tested and make sure they're viable. You can't just like, if you have an old steam system, you can't assume you're gonna go to an air to water system. But sometimes it's, it is possible. Good question. Yeah, there are, so there are designs of uh, cool water for cooling. I don't recommend it. You, you can have condensation, sweating issues on the floor. Really, you'd need to put a small duct system into that air to water heat pump that's for cooling. It doesn't need to be as extensive as a duct system for to heat your whole house, because you might not need it in every single bedroom, right? We're, we don't kind of have the same cooling needs as we do with heating. Great question. Yep, there's a, a, a half a dozen or so available through that for that ten thousand dollar incentives. They're very expensive. You know, you're looking at thirty thousand dollars. Yep. Um, you know, just I'm just throwing that number out there, of course. But basically, I from what I've seen so far, it's twenty five to thirty percent more than a air source system. Probably because you're working with much smaller companies, much limited companies that can install them, and they tend to be the higher end engineering thinking contractors. I think that's part of it. Any other questions? Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's a good, just saying you're using both systems is, is valuable, right? Like there, there's lots of times when, you know, keeping your fossil system, but it really is for the coldest days of winter. It's kind of like how people use wood stoves, right? It's like when you really need it. And then on the shoulder seasons, you use the heat pumps when they're the most efficient. So that's super. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. And you, you probably didn't think you needed cooling until you had it, and then you're like, oh, this is quite nice, isn't it? Yeah. Any other questions? I think I'm done. Thank you. Chris pushed me off. All right, thanks. Okay, so now we're gonna move from uh, the more expensive um, energy conservation and complicated energy conservation ideas to a, a simpler and less expensive um, option for you. Um, David Goodwin is going to talk about how to make a window insert for energy conservation. And David is the um, chair of the Sunderland Energy Committee. He has an undergraduate degree from the University of Colorado in, energy, in environmental conservation, master's degree in, from UMass, um, worked for the Holyoke Conservation Commission, was a professional staff lecturer for UMass in the Department of Natural Resources for 21 years and 10 years as worked as an assistant state land manager at the DCR Bureau of Forestry. And uh, David's also been my best friend for most of my life, so. <laughs> but that's not why he's here. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. So I'm sure I'm kind of preaching to the choir here. And I see a lot of familiar faces who I know have attended some of our window inserts uh, workshops. So we have a lot of expertise here. Um, I'm also joined by Laura Williams, who is on the Sunderland, uh, Sunderland Energy Committee. And she has been the person who's been responsible for running all six of our workshops. So she's an expert and she brought a visual aid here, which is gonna be great. Uh, Steve Svoboda, Steve here? I guess he bailed out. Uh, he, he um, I'm not sure if he ever attended any of our workshops, but he's made all the window inserts for their entire house. So he knows a whole lot about it. Uh, definitely more than me. So it's nice to have Laura here to help me out for some questions that I may not be able to answer. Um, okay. If your window looks like this, Probably a window insert is not going to help you a whole lot, okay? Uh, you might want to put your money into, uh, into getting new windows. But as we know, windows are pretty expensive. Uh, the basic physics of airflow infiltration, you know, if you, on a windy day in my kitchen, I put my hands up on the window and you feel it coming in all around. And these are even double pane, fairly modern windows. So there's a whole bunch of air infiltration in there. This is really tiny, so I cannot see this without my glasses. Um, according to the, uh, uh, the uh, Department of Energy, heat gains and losses through a window are responsible for 25 to 30 percent of a home's HVAC energy consumption. So that's pretty significant. Uh, energy Star studies show that replacing just one, uh, a single pane window with a double pane window can save you 21 to 31 percent of your energy cost. So it's pretty significant. Uh, but as you know, it's super expensive to replace your windows. You can, you can spend 300, you can spend 1,000, you could probably spend a lot more than that even on replacing your windows. So our chat, well, not yet, okay. Uh, so this graph shows how you can increase the R value of your windows up one notch, up the, the uh, the numbers I've seen is that by adding a window insert into a window, it changes the R value, increases it one or two points. So it's pretty significant. It also decreases the U value, which is the amount of infiltration, um, I'm sorry, the amount of heat that escapes through a window. So obviously as you, as you move from left to right on this graph, you're, you're getting more and more um, fancy, expensive, double, triple pane windows. And so if you add a window insert, you can pretty much move almost up one whole notch there. So it's a pretty significant uh, change that you can make to your windows. Uh, one of the big challenges I had from this PowerPoint presentation is does not, did not translate from my computer to this computer very well. So unfortunately, uh, some of the photos which I took at, one, at the last uh, 
inserts workshop that we did, some of them worked, some of them didn't. Some of the videos that I took worked, most of them didn't. So unfortunately, we're not gonna be, I'm not gonna be able to share that with you today, but I'm gonna describe them so you can use your imagination. Oh, let me go up here. So the challenge obviously was how to improve the R value of your windows inexpensively, and the solution here is window inserts. Um, so we've had, or I should say Laura has had six workshops. I attended the last one. 21 participants um, across those six workshops constructed 38 window inserts, and the cost was an astonishing $20 to $25 per, per window insert. So it's an extremely cost-effective way of doing this. The steps are pretty, pretty, uh, pretty obvious. We needed people to register for the workshop. We needed them to take really exact measurements of their windows. And then here was the hard part, which we didn't, we didn't, uh, we actually got folks to do for us is build the wooden frames. So once you had a good window, a good wooden frame, uh, we had those ready for people at the workshop when they came in, purchased the materials that we need. I'll go through what the materials were. Attend the workshop and leave with your little window insert. Um, we have a more detailed um, sheet of what the materials are for this uh, process. I just kind of summarized it here. Uh, we have handouts if you're interested in more information about this. Laura has them, thank you Laura. The ultrafilm, which is a, sh a heat shrink wrap material which works really well. Foam weather stripping double-sided tape, the pop, we use poplar for these windows. You don't have to use poplar, but that's the wood that we used for these window inserts and clear packing tape. So before the workshop, we, we actually partnered with Franklin County Tech, students there, Frontier Regional, students there, Smith Vocational as well, and a unknown family member who assembled all these frames ahead of time, uh, custom cut all the pieces with the user supply measurements. And as far as I can remember, there's only one window that didn't fit perfectly and it, it came down to the person didn't measure it very well. Uh, assemble each frame and take it to the workshop. Well, boop. All right, so our process was you would lay out your film on a table, on a nice flat table, put two-sided tape around one edge, carefully lay that on your film, and fold it over. Oh, going the wrong way again. And roll the film, and, and then put the tape on the second side, take the film, fold it over, so you, you, know, you try to get it as nice as you possibly can. Um, and then you trim the overhanging film with box cutter or scissors. And this was, all right. One, one piece of advice. If you have a workshop on this, do not invite Jim Carrey. Because if he gets a hold of your packing tape, that's what he's gonna do, so don't invite him. Um, <laughs> so this is where I had a nice little video that, that showed how this whole process is done from laying it down, folding it over, and cutting it, but I can't show you that because it will tell me some nasty message. Um, and then the next step is to blow dry it, uh, the film on both sides with a hair dryer. And it's amazing how, you know, you try to get it pretty smooth, you get it all taped down nicely around the edges, and you start blow drying. We use high heat, it, it will melt obviously, so you have to be, I don't know, four or five inches away, something like that, to make sure that you don't melt the film, starting the, start the edge and come to the center, and it's amazing, it goes from this kind of wrinkly film to this beautiful tight as a drum. And you know, you're standing there and you're watching the whole process and wow, all of a sudden it looks really professional. So, that, so that's a nice little surprise. Oh, okay. Um, the process that we used was to use the clear packing tape to make little tabs to put on the bottom so that you could, you could pull the frames out real nice and easy. Uh, once they're installed. You can either tape or, uh, staple or tape uh, those to the outside edge and they work pretty well. You can also be 
feel free to use your own innovation if you don't like the looks of the little packing tape tabs, but we found that worked really well. Um, and here was kind of a critical step to this as well, was to add the weather stripping around the edge. And what we found pretty early on was that if you tried to like stretch it out a little bit and not, not just lay it on exactly how it wanted to lie on top of your, the edge of your frame, it would kind of pull itself. It would, it would, it would constrict a little bit and then it wouldn't, you would have gaps and it wouldn't work all that well. So five minutes, thank you. Um, so our, our little uh, uh, pro tip here is don't stretch it. Just put it right on nice and, nice and easy. Oh, did I just do that one? Yes, I did. All right, so. Yeah, unless you air condition, you may want to keep them in all year. I don't know. Although, I want, I want fresh air in my house in the summertime as much as I can. Um, so Meg, who's a new member of our energy committee, and Laura put together this great little video showing in Meg's house how she puts it into her window, takes it out, and it's nice and easy. But unfortunately, that doesn't work either. So say the average cost of these windows is about $25. Um, so I think this is the Department of Energy stat that I saw. So it says each square foot of insert saves about a gallon of oil per year, which is pretty significant. So, yeah. So in red here, the payback for an average window insert, I figure, is about eight square feet, uh, $4 per gallon per, for oil, $32 of savings per year per window. That is if you know, you heat it, kept them in all year. So in this case, each window insert would pay for itself in easily less than a year. It's like eight months. Um, the Island Institute of Maine has, has put together a lot of information on window inserts as well. And there's a link here. And of course, that won't work either because it doesn't like my, my link for some reason. Um, but if you want to, I don't know what that means. Uh, if you wanted to look that up, you would, <clears throat> if you do, do a search on the Island Institute, you would find all sorts of great videos that some of my stole for this, which you can't see. A lot of pictures, a lot of great information, materials, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, that's it. If you've got any questions, comments, yeah. Laura, you probably have a better estimate, but I would guess about an hour. Okay. Yeah, at the most. Yeah, they're pretty quick. I mean, once you have the frames, it goes really quickly. So. Yep, yep. Yeah, so they would leave the workshop with sometimes a whole trunk full of these inserts. Yeah, so it's a, I was a little, I have to say, I was a little skeptical at first. Ooh, film covered frame window inserts? I thought they would look kind of cheesy, but I think they're really impressive and they work really well. Chris, you had a question? I don't think it is at our Energy Committee website, um, but Laura does have handouts if you would like to get a copy of that. That gives, get, that gives a lot more information. Chris? Two sides. Yeah. And the weather stripping is really critical here because that, you know, here are the, here are the little plastic tabs and just putting the window fits in nice and tight. Pull it out. Yeah. Ever so slightly because you want the, the tightest fit you can easily, well, not easily, with a little bit of effort, pull in and out. Yes. Yes, you do. I don't. Yeah. He does. It's a company called Winsert. It's just, yeah, just uh, Google Winsert. It's like window insert, but Winsert. Yeah, I'd be curious to know how much they charge for it. Cause uh, they have something, um, but they're, they're customers. Somebody out here that comes in 
Right, right, and do a little measurement. Yeah, so the hardest part of this whole process is making the frames. So if you have, if you have I think, minimal carpentry skills and, you know, a good saw, you could, yeah, right, that would be extremely helpful, yeah. Yes? Heck yeah. Right, Laura? Right. Well, that's why Steve was one of our co-presenters. He's not here, but he wants to do it in Deerfield. So, yeah. Anything else? Well, thank you for, for lasting the entire day. This is great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, we have one last speaker, and uh, that is Rory Donahoe. Uh, from MassSave, um, or from rather from Clear Result Energy, and he's going to be talking about MassSave residential offerings for home energy assessments and eligible products. Um, and thank you. Rory got introduced into the energy efficiency industry by taking the renewable energy course offered at Greenfield Community College, and from there he, he managed the neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor solar hot water program and worked as, as the contractor outreach coordinator for Co-op Power for a few years. After that, he worked as a mass save insulator um, and then uh, worked in contractor services for the Center for Eco Technology for three years before becoming an energy specialist for Clear Result. So that's where he is from now and Rory. Do you wanna hold this? Thanks, Chris. Wow, I actually hadn't heard that bio out loud before. I was like, I did all that? That was a long time ago. I see a lot of familiar faces. I feel like I've pretty much everyone here has probably done an assessment. I might have actually done one at your house. If it went well, that was me anyway. If not, it was probably someone else. Um, so yeah, this could be a refresher because it seems like we have a very knowledgeable crowd today. Make sure I'm pressing the right button here. So what is Mass Save? Everyone can hear me all right, right? Great, perfect. Mass Save is an initiative sponsored by the Massachusetts Natural Gas and Electric Utilities and Energy Efficiency Service Providers to help Massachusetts residents and businesses manage their energy use and related costs. Um, you've probably seen this little charge hidden away in your utility bill. Uh, that finances the Mass Save program. It's basically a pool that everyone pays into, which is all the more reason to get a home energy assessment because we're all paying for it. So, what are the benefits of energy efficiency? Why would you get a home energy assessment? I mean, there's more than I could even speak on, but big ones would be an improvement in indoor air quality in your house, your ability to control and dictate the air coming into your house. Uh, just, it's more subjective, but it's certainly valid, just the comfort level of your house. It's hard to put a number on that. Uh, reducing your carbon footprint, and of course, money talks, reducing your electric and heating bill. So how does the residential home energy program work? Well, the first step is you get a home energy assessment with a guy like me. I come into your house, I take a look around at all the areas of concern, usually your attic, your walls, your basement, your crawl spaces, all the gross places no one wants to go in their house, and I see what you've got for insulation and air sealing. I take a look at your heating systems, and then we put together a list of recommendations and most often a proposal for some weatherization work through the program. Uh, then we also go over uh, potential upgrades to heating systems, uh, HVAC systems, um, certainly could 
talk a lot about mini splits. It's a big year for mini splits, but um, I believe that was covered pretty thoroughly. Uh, and we also offer uh, the instant savings measures, which I'll touch on a little bit later. So uh, in the era of COVID, we have uh, brought out a new product, which is the virtual home energy assessments. The virtual home energy assessments basically work the same as an in-house assessment would. Uh, only you use video conferencing software, typically Zoom, Duo, something like that. Walk around the house, um, and we just basically look at all the same areas of concern, try to get some pictures. We don't expect anyone to be crawling around in their crawl space or attic, but you know, as long as we can get our, a visual on the areas, we're able to put together a pretty accurate uh, site visit report and weatherization proposal. Uh, so in order, you know, what you would want to have uh, ready for that is just to have access to these places. Uh, be, you know, somewhat savvy with the you know, virtual conferencing software. And good Wi-Fi helps. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at anyone who lives in Conway. Um, Oh, fantastic news. I won't cringe every time I see it on my schedule. Um, so, like I said, you basically get, you know, the same thing you would with an in-house. Uh, we send you a full site phys report after the assessment's done. Uh, we send you the full rebate packet that goes over all the different rebates you qualify for towards uh, HVAC systems, and then we also mail out uh, the instant savings measures, as well as uh, issue you the heat loan intake form. Yep, so I covered this a little bit, basically what you would want to have uh, ready and, you know, be prepared for, for a virtual home energy assessment, you know, being comfortable on a ladder, being able to get to the places that we would want to you know, put together a proposal for. So if you can't get into your attic, then a virtual assessment just probably would not be for you. Or if you just aren't able to use the Zoom or Duo or any of those for any number of reasons. Uh, in which case we offer the in-house assessments. So I mentioned the instant savings measures right now that pretty much covers the smart power strips. Anyone who's had an assessment is familiar with those. It's basically a power strip that has one master outlet and then a row of outlets that uh, only turn on when the master outlet is turned on. These are great for like home entertainment systems when you got your TV and then you've got like a DVD player, Blu-ray player, Xbox, Nintendo, whatever. Uh, you know, kind of mechanicals and that don't need to be on unless the TV's on. You turn the TV on, sends power to all those, turn the TV off, takes power away from all those, stops that sort of phantom load or, you know, that idling uh, power. And if you're like me and you got an eight-year-old who's never turned off a light switch or a video game in his life, it, it comes in handy. Uh, we also offer your standard programmable thermostats. Um, you know, those work basically by setting the time to and temperature to go up at a certain time of day and then come back down at a certain time of day. It basically kind of takes out any variables and user behavior. So if you're like me, you get up and you go to work at the same time every single day, then you set your thermostat and it automatically drops down and automatically comes back up when I come back home. Shower heads and faucet aerators, we call them uh, water saving, not low flow, because nobody wants a low flow shower head. Uh, they use less water, but they do retain a similar water pressure. I walk the walk, I've got one in my house, it works great. Um, so we also offer smart thermostats. Uh, basically, same idea is the programmable thermostats. Uh, however, you can also use them uh, remo remotely on your phone, 
Uh, so you would download an app and you could, be, you could control it. So if you're away from your home, it really works well in situations where you don't really have a consistent schedule. Uh, you can kind of monitor it and then it just kind of goes from there. I, I won't speak on it too much because you could, I, you could probably spend a whole workshop talking about smart thermostats, but there's all sorts of things you can monitor and, and kind of tinker with uh, once you have those installed as well as hooking it up to like sort of more smart house technology like you know the Google Alexas and all those things. Uh, we also still, while we don't offer the LED thermostats, I'm LED thermos, LED light bulbs uh, as instant savings measures anymore. You can still purchase them at a reduced rate on the website, as well as advanced power strip, smart power strips, which appear to be the same thing with more outlets. <laughs> um, so. What is weatherization? Weatherization is pretty much the lifeblood of the residential energy program. Basically, weatherization can be boiled down to is every house has what's called a thermal barrier. The thermal barrier is what separates outside space from inside space. We want to make sure that you have a strong, solid thermal barrier going around your house which means increasing insulation and air sealing in your attic, in your walls, in your basement, and crawl spaces. Um, the insulation portion uh, basically pertains to if you don't have enough insulation in your attic, we bring that level up to uh, now 15 inches. If you've got an older house where it was built in 1900 and no one touched the walls ever since, they're probably still empty. So dense packing the walls with cellulose would also be the insulation as well as adding insulation to the basement. The air sealing is as if not more important than the insulation. And that usually means creating a consistent air barrier through the house. Uh, that's your wall tops, your plumbing penetrations, electrical penetrations, all just fancy words for holes in your th thermal envelope that get sealed shut, that stop infiltration coming into your house from outside and exfiltration going out of your house, typically through the attic. So here are some prime examples of some air sealing. Uh, you can see right there in the top left-hand corner, those ugly black lines are signs that you've got airflow coming up through an attic. The air is just kind of filtering up through that fiberglass bat and enough to make it turn black. Might have been a smoker's house. Uh, and how do we treat something like that? Well, you look at the uh, top right and you see there's air sealing. Use a couple different types of material, but nine times out of 10, it's gonna be one part foam. And they're going around the electrical penetrations, the wall tops, just kind of going through and making sure that you got that consistent air barrier. Uh, so that stops the exfiltration. Where's the infiltration coming from? Where are you getting the cold air? So a house works a lot like a chimney. Chimney, the hot air rises up through the top and it needs, what happens when you don't have a draft, when you don't have pole at the bottom of the house? It, that air's not pulling through. So you need a return, and that return for a house is outside. So that cold air is being pulled into the house from the bottom of the house as the heat is rising. Most of the time, that is coming from the rim joist area, which you see at the bottom here. Uh, so we air seal that. Uh, we air seal the plumbing penetrations. We kind of, you know, box frame inside each one of those little rectangular cavities and we hit the sill plate and that's a huge air sealing opportunity and makes huge difference in the house. Uh, here's some good examples of insulation, old reliable cellulose, which is uh, still the standard uh, for insulation, and even in new construction, um, second only to spray foam, but from a you know cost savings standpoint, cellulose is, is still the way to go. Um, you see in the top right, we've got what's called a thermodome, but basically every ha house that has an attic usually has a hatch. We insulate and we air seal the hatch. 
Uh, the thermodome is when you've got one of those drop-down staircases. The staircase folds up. We build a custom box that sits on top at a thermal barrier board, has a weather stripping gasket on it, and some straps. So that creates a insulation barrier of about R14 as well as give, giving you a strong air barrier. That alone is worth doing because that is, without that, that's basically a giant hole in your ceiling. Like there is no, like even the newer drop down staircases don't really have any air ceiling quality to them. Uh, bottom left corner is something we've probably all seen driving around uh, is dense packing the exterior walls. Um, so here we've got, uh, looks like cedar shakes. Uh, they cut a hole uh, in each bay. They ran a hose down each bay, dense packed it with cellulose, weatherized the hole shut, and uh, after this is done, they're gonna, they likely just put the shakes back into place. And ideally, it should look a lot like how it looked before uh, we started the work, especially with the shakes. Those are the easiest ones to work with. And then in the bottom right corner, you've got a rim joist. So in the previous picture, you saw the picture of the air sealed rim joist. After that, we add a fiberglass bat to give it uh, R19 insulation value. Now, onto the, onto the rough stuff. So the types of houses that often need insulation, especially in insulation walls, are older houses. Older houses typically have roadblocks. Um, most often, and one of the biggest ones we run into, of course, is knob and tube wiring. Uh, I won't go too deep into it because um, I've got five minutes left in a lot of slides. Uh, but uh, basically, it's an old type of wiring, uh, it's, and it works by being air cooled. You wouldn't want to cover some uh, electrical wiring that's air-cooled with insulation because you can kind of guess what would happen next. Uh, so the next uh, big roadblock you see quite often is vermiculite. The program kind of airs on the side of caution and just says all vermiculite potentially contains asbestos. Therefore, we don't want to send a team of insulators up there to roll around in it, cause it to be airborne, you know, and cause all sorts of issues. Also, you got an older house, you likely got an older boiler or furnace, which very likely could have some issues with carbon monoxide, which we would want to treat before we go and tighten your house up. So I'm about to get on to how we treat and remediate all that very soon, but I want to touch base on uh, what our COVID-19 weatherization procedures are these days. I mean, I thought COVID was over. I thought we were on to celebrity slap fights now, but, um, but yeah, so we still practice all uh, CDC guidelines. We do this six foot uh, social distancing. We still wear masks, we wear gloves, we do uh, periodic wellness checks. Anyone who's even got the sniffles stays home until they've got a negative test result, and we stay trained up on all, uh, as the health standards kind of change going down the line. Um, so, yes, uh, as Aiden mentioned, there are some huge rebates for uh, mini splits and air source heat pumps right now. Uh, it's a big year for, mit for air source heat pumps. Uh, we offer a $10,000 whole house uh, rebate that uh, covers pretty much the lion's share of the uh, air source heat pump uh, project would. Uh, we also offer rebates for uh, washing machines, dryers, water heating equipment, and uh, some natural gas furnaces and boilers, although I think some of the natural gas stuff might be getting phased out. So the heat loan. Uh, the heat loan is what stops these things from being cost prohibitive for a lot of people, because like I said, houses that need the insulation, older houses, older houses typically have roadblocks. You can use our 0% interest seven-year home loan to finance things like uh, the insulation and remediating of knob and tube, uh, remediating of vermiculite, and there is an incentive uh, towards 
uh, if you've got you know car high carbon monoxide for your boiler. And then of course, just if you got an old boiler, you probably want to replace it anyway, especially if it's got har high carbon monoxide and you can use the heat loan to finance new heating systems. Well, new heating and cooling systems like the air source heat pumps. We also offer the heat loan uh, for solar thermal hot water systems, uh, battery storage for photovoltaic, and if you have single pane windows, you can use the heat loan to finance them. Another way we keep this from being cost prohibitive is uh, we do offer a moderate income rebate. So if you qualify, it is income eligible. You can get pretty much no cost insulation work as well as uh, assistance and uh, incentives towards uh, uh, roadblock remediation. Hey, I know that guy. Um, so another pretty big incentive out there is for multi-unit houses. Uh, if you have, if it's a multi-unit and it meets qualifications, we do uh, no cost insulation and air sealing work. And this is what I was talking about as far as the moderate income incentives. So for knob and tube, I mean, I, I don't know if anyone's ever priced out knob and tube, but yeah, $7,000 is probably the minimum. So, you know, the, that incentive can be huge for some people as well as the, uh, say you've got asbestos work, you've got asbestos wrapped steam pipe, stuff like that, getting that remediated, we offer a $4,000 incentive for that. And then vermiculite removal, <laughs> asbestos abatement is also a uh, huge ticket item. So uh, we do offer a seven thousand uh, dollar incentive to help out with the cost of that for income eligible customers. Um, so I talked about what the uh, site visit reports are, and you know the proposals you get after the work is done. This is a pretty good example of one. This is what you would typically see uh, for this style house if it hadn't been touched before. Uh, looking at 10 hours of the air sealing, which would also include weather stripping kits on, on your doors, uh, ventilation, um, bending bath fans, if your bath fan's still invented, and uh, of course the insulation in the attic, and it looks like also uh, insulating the rim joist in the basement. So that is uh, my boilerplate. <laughs> kind of walkthrough of what the residential energy uh, program is and uh, be happy to field any questions. Would, be a, would there be a cost involved in keeping the energy audit on service? This is the residential, so I have done churches before. So I would call, uh, they'll, they'll kind of screen to make sure it qualifies, but I've certainly done uh, assessments on, on churches where there was a live-in resident. Those are fun. <laughs> I like doing those, so yeah. The blower door test is conducted during the installation of the work. So once the uh, contractor comes to do the work, they do a pre-blower door test to see how tight the house already is, and then they do, you know, then they try to get that number up to what the building air and flow standard for that house would be. After they're done, they do a post as well. Yes. Yes. We base it on the existing system. So if you have an assessment and I go there and I see that your existing washer qualifies, yeah. Yeah, we, we don't retroactively. I love your hair, by the way. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Two calendar years. So you want to get another one, uh, but 
you know, I think it's worth the time since a lot's changed in that time. Also, $32 a year in savings on Winserts? That's crazy. That blew my mind. That's awesome. I'm going to make some. Yes? It actually is a air sealing measure, not a weatherization measure. So yes, it is no cost. Could you repeat the question, please? He was asking about the thermodome. Remember the big silver box? Yep, so that's, that's considered an air sealing measure. So the insulation is incentivized up to 75%. The air sealing is no cost. So because it's air sealing, you get one, we don't say free, free, no, but it's a no cost uh, measure. All right. Thank you, guys. So thanks to uh, Aiden, David, and Rory. And, and thank you all for sticking around to the end here. Really appreciate all of your involvement. I think it was a very successful day. And uh, hopefully, we'll get to do it again at some point. Have a good afternoon, everybody.